One other thing before I start, I want to go over a few things because otherwise you will be thinking, what is askeza? What is affirmation? What is mantra? So when I'm referring to askeza, what askeza means? For example, when you're doing fasting, you're just drinking water, right? What you're doing is, if people are doing fasting to lose weight, then they're not doing askeza. They're doing to lose weight. The fasting is done to connect to higher power, to God. Today you'll hear a lot of me talking to God, but I don't want you to hear it, God who is punishing you, okay? God that, is, that truly loves you. So sometimes people who have a very religious background think when I'm talking God is connects to like, oh, I'm bad, I'm a sinner. So please disconnect from that conversation of God. Can you do that? Or if you'd like, I'm gonna call God higher power. Will that make you feel more comfortable? <laughs> is everybody okay with God? Okay, good. And so askeza is something that we do in order to connect and overcome something. So any confusion about what askeza is. So when I'll be saying askeza, you will understand that this is something you do to connect to higher power, to God, to overcome something in your life. Also, if I'm talking about mantra, mantra has to be done in Sanskrit language. If you're doing mantra in Russian, that means it's affirmation. Clear? And if we're talking about prayer, today I might be saying a prayer to everything uh, to make it easier. But actually prayer is your conversation to God and how to do prayer correctly. And so today I'm going to be breaking down step by step what is mantra, what is askeza, how to do affirmations correctly, and why we need askezas for, okay? And we're going to have a much deeper conversation about life and why we struggle in life, okay? Um, all right, friends. So... So I just want to acknowledge that in order to live a full life and to live a happy life, not a surviving, we need to have a power. We need to have power and inner strength. And so when I'm saying inner strength and power, what are you hearing? Mm-hmm. Energy. Greater good. Mm? Greater good. Greater good. What else? Fearless. Fearless. Okay. Self-worth. Hmm? Self-worth. Self-worth. Okay. Now, in general, when a person is lacking power, it's because they are confused and they're lost. And they could be lost in just one area. And that could, the area could be a relationship with a boyfriend or husband, a relationship to a child or a parent, or themselves and their well-being. And so right now I want to go over where the person actually gets the power. And the person gets power from either their consciousness and they know what's the right thing and what's the bad thing. Everyone knows when you live and doing, for example, your intuition, your God tells you not to get this job. You see the red flags. There's bad boss, bad organization. And if you don't listen to it, you will pay the price afterwards. But some of us are so lost and confused that we don't even listen. We're so out of tune with our connection, our consciousness, and our intuition. And then my question is, what do you think? Who can you go to to connect to that consciousness? Yes, God is the way, but for those who... Sometimes when people are so lost and confused, they are so lethargic, they have no energy, 
it's not natural to go to God. And so if they don't go to God, who do you think they should go to? <laughs> well, I'm honored. Uh, friends. However, friends are struggling too in life. Can they really tell you and guide you out of the darkness and out of confusion and out of the breakdown where you're struggling either with your husband, either with your kids, or financially, or have a terrible boss and you're just surviving your work? Who can you really go to? Mentor. Yes, but why? And what kind of mentor? Somewhere, someone who's where you want to be. You see, in order, we call it in Vedic knowledge, older. But when people hear older, they're thinking they're older age-wise. But not necessarily. Older is someone who is wise and knows knows the knowledge and older is someone who is kind because some people have knowledge but they are not kind and if that person has the knowledge but they're not kind they won't be able to give you the knowledge that will touch your heart because Vedas are explained, if you find someone who is older, who is wise and kind, when you talk to them, God himself talks to you. And it touches your heart. And then you will be able to get consciousness from them. And when this older person talks to you, the truth has a bitter taste. It doesn't feel good. But once you understand the truth, and it might take you a few days and maybe a few weeks, but once you understand it, you feel really good. Then the truth tastes really sweet. But we're surrounded by people, and when people are in struggle, they go to friends, they go to psychic reader, astrologist, or even coaches or therapists who tell them what they want to hear. And then this person is not growing. And it's not connecting to consciousness. And we need this consciousness. So the people who are older give us connection to consciousness. But also they help us with askeza for our mind. They give us the power how to overcome the challenge. Now, if you don't have, this is, by the way, the most difficult way to get knowledge and effective. Difficult. Uh, I will give you an example. A year ago, my husband and I were talking about our son's education. And we were not agreeing. And I was not happy about it. And I was very stubborn about it. He was also very stubborn about it. And we were just stuck. We hardly ever argue. And here we're not just like, we don't agree with it. And I'm thinking, well, I know better. I'm mother. And I was so righteous about it. And then two days later, I was so stressed about it. I called my spiritual teacher. I talked to him and he said, Alisa, you know what? Go to your husband and apologize and tell him he's right. And everything in me is like, what? I know I'm right. What is he talking about? And he said, well, just do it. And when you have a mentor like that, when you have a guru like that, you got to do what they say. So I'm going against my pride, coming to my husband and say, you know what, honey, you're right. We're going to do as you say. And my husband smiles, hugs me, and he said, and you know what? I realized you were right. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you think it would be possible if I didn't give up my view? It wouldn't. And that's what makes it difficult. When you go to older for an advice, they will tell you. But you got to do the work. Make sense? But the easiest way, 
But the dangerous way is to listen to lectures. Because when you listen to lectures and no one holds you accountable, why is it easy? Because you can do it or not. I want to wake up and do askeza, I do it. I don't feel like waking up and doing the affirmation or prayer, I don't do it. No one holds you accountable. And that's why it's easy. But there's little results. But still, as a human beings, we grow through sound. If you want to become someone who is kind, listen to a kind guru, spiritual kind guru. If you want to get the motivation, you need to listen first. Before I start doing all of the things that I'm going to be sharing with you today, I am kidding you not, I was listening to a spiritual lecture, my guru, for probably a year and a half before I start taking action. So I can accumulate and absorb all the knowledge. And only then I start doing, okay, five minutes this and 10 minutes that. But a lot of people, and I know a few people very close to me, who thinks that if I don't wake up and do a skeza for an hour, that's not good enough. I'm not going to do it at all. This is perfectionism. You got to start with the baby steps. Nothing changes overnight. And every little step is good than nothing. Even the five minutes going to accumulate over the year. You cannot be born and start running. It's never going to happen. Everything starts with little, little steps. And so as I'm going to be sharing, I want you to keep that in the background. Otherwise, again, you're attached to perfection. And in life is not black and white. We're mainly in the gray, but we want to start shifting slowly towards white. Yeah? So far, any questions? And let me check with people on the Zoom if they have any questions. Any, any questions, you can raise your hand and ask me. No? Wonderful. All right, then. Give me a second. For example, why do we need to also go to older people? And we have to show them respect because in life there's people older, equal and younger. Younger are the ones who are not age-wise, who are maybe have less knowledge. If you respect older, you're gonna get the respect from younger and when people, older people, wiser people, feel that you respect them, you come to them. What will happen, you're gonna have a blessing. For example, you are at work, you have a boss, and if you respect him that he is older, wiser, you will start climbing the ladder faster than anybody else. For example, when I get stopped on the highway and police officer wants to give me a ticket, I look at the officer and I say, I am sorry, officer, that I was speeding. And they usually look at me, they're like, I apologize. And I look kindly in their eyes, acknowledging for their work that they're doing, they usually smile back at me, it's like, drive, but slow down, okay? I'm like, okay. This is the reaction. People who are older, they're waiting. They're waiting to give their knowledge, to give the protection, to give what they know to younger. And in our current society, what we're missing is older people. And we're missing younger people who respect older people. Make sense? Because everybody wants to compete. I know it all. I know it all. And so now what I would like for you to get, that the husband and men in a society are older. And that's why my guru told me, go and apologize to your husband. <laughs> Not because he knows better. It's just because he's older. 
And we don't live in a society and we don't function like that in a society. We want to be equal and we want to be righteous and we want to argue. And when we have that position that I am older, that creates tension. That creates problems. At least 40% of people who are in this program today were telling me that they're single and they want to marry a man who is a provider and protector. And I will tell you, the key to finding a man who is a provider and protector is to learn how to respect older. That men are authority. Their hierarchy, here's God, here's guru, then there's men, and then there's women. And then there's kids and cats and dogs. If you think, and we're living in a society where, hi Michael, if we live in a society where we feel like we're equal, men will never feel the desire to protect you and to provide for you. Because we feel that I deserve better. And now I want you to be with me in a conversation because we're moving into a much deeper conversation that might be confronting for you. Because every man wants a woman to submit and surrender to him. Isn't that true? Yeah, yes. She Thank you. That. Thank you. <laughs> That's what Vedas are explaining. And every woman is emotional and uncontrollable with her emotions. And she wants a relationship, connection to go the way she wants to. And by the way, that's how a woman is selfish in a relationship, and that's how man is selfish. But this is our nature. But now what I really want to bring to the space is that we each in life are dealing with something. Some of us are dealing with relationship problems, some again with money, some with kids. And now I want you to be with it because everything that you have and dealing with is that you need to deal with it. And Vedas are explaining, now don't be confronted by this word. It's, it, this word. it's not about a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing. Is that you brought it to yourself in order to overcome something meaning you pretty much deserve the struggle and crisis you're in because overcoming through this crisis gonna get you to a completely different level that in the background you want to be. Now, this is important. If you don't understand it, you have to ask me a question. So for example, if hypothetically you're going through right now a cheating wife, let's say. You need to go through the crisis of a cheating wife in order to experience this pain because you've caused this pain in the previous life, this is how Vedas are explaining it, that you were cheating in the previous life and now you gotta go through this pain in order to clear this karma. But if you're walking away from cheating wife without forgiving her, without making a peace, you're gonna be going through, you didn't overcome your exam basically. Does this make sense? If you go through a health crisis, let's say you have a tumor, you have to go through tumor in order to overcome the karma that you haven't been taking care of yourself. The askeza for health is you got to be taking care of not only your physical body, keeping it clean, but also your emotional body. Meaning you have to be in balance with your physical body and emotional body and have integrity in order not to have serious illnesses. And so now I'm going to start going over askezas for different type of struggle that you're dealing with in life. But I need you to ask me questions if you're not clear about anything. Because right now you're looking at me, but I don't know. Where are you? Are you connecting to it or not? It's yes. Ludmilla. Well, it's making me think of um, mm -hmm. clients that have 
trouble with the idea that I created this bad situation for myself. So what they hear sometimes is, oh, so it's my fault. Uh -huh. There's a, you know, resistance, there's ego about it. When the freedom in, in realizing that is, oh, so I have power in the situation to change it. So maybe for if anyone's hearing this, like, what? So I'm attracting this struggle and you're feeling that resistance? Consider that it's actually power, even though it might not look like it. Yeah. Uh, also, Vedas, thank you, uh, Eileen, because Vedas are explaining. <laughs> ah, Peach, it's okay. Oh my God. That's horrible, of course, but I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, okay. Vedas are explaining, whenever we go through crisis in life, is this is how God loves us. Because people don't go to God. It's not seeking connection to God if everything is good. Can you connect to it? You're not going to be seeking a knowledge. You're not going to be seeking a guru. You're not going to be going to church or temple or synagogue or mosque or anywhere if everything is good. And during the breakdown, if you're going to do the work, you're going to overcome things 100 times faster than any other time. But during the crisis, what happens is we're so stuck in ourselves. Poor me, this is not happening. Poor me, wife is cheating on me. Poor me, I don't have a job. Poor me, I don't have a money. And this is, by the way, what Vedas are explaining, is our selfishness. We're too connected to ourselves and our problems. And in order to overcome that question, what do you think you should be doing? What is that? This is still, it's all about me. Why is this happening to me? Poor me. Keep thinking. I felt almost kind of an epiphany because I was stuck in that. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, how can I be of service? And it was like the pressure was off. Like, it's okay if my personal life is a mess. Like, yes. I'm here to like bring kindness, bring mm -hmm. love. Yes. It really like, like the pressure just melted away. Yes, so just to, uh, for uh, Zoom people to hear, for our participants over the Zoom, that Carolyn explained, the moment you want to serve people, the pressure is off. By the way, Vedas are explaining, there is no depression. It's all uh, egoism, selfishness. It's all selfishness. It's all me. Me, somebody help me, somebody save me, I'm sinking. The moment person gonna start helping homeless people, helping cats and dogs in a um, shelter, helping older people, helping the community, all of the struggles go away. But we're too stuck into, it's not working, this is so bad. This is so bad. My life is so terrible. And by the way, um, in Vedas, it's also explaining it's one of the biggest sins. When we're complaining, when we're crying, when we are, life is not good, this is not working, it considers to be a sin. Because you are rebelling against God, saying you're not happy. You're not happy. I'm not happy with my husband. I'm not happy with my kid. I'm not happy with my parent. I'm not happy with my job. I don't like my money. I don't like what I'm doing. This is all rebelling against God. And there's zero responsibility on your part when we do that. And so the fastest way to overcome the struggle is to start serving. And so for people who are single, and made a request that they want to get married, the fastest way you're going to get married is to start serving the community. God gives you first, if you want to get married, a big family. Big family. 
maybe in church, maybe in other spiritual community, somewhere else, where you help this person and the other person and this person and that person. And when you're helping, you're making God happy, then only then he sends you a small family. And by the way, all men and all women in the relationship and marriage sooner or later says, why did I get this woman? Why did I get this wife? Why did I get this woman? They're not happy because women are stubborn and they don't like the stubbornness. Women are very stubborn. And by the way, for a man, when he's dating a woman, he needs to date her for four, five, six months without connecting to her sexually to even understand what is her, where is her teeth? Because women have teeth and they start showing their teeth, their stubbornness only after three, four, five months. And then he has to see, can I be with her teeth? Some teeth are the great white shark and he's like, no, thank you. I better run. But some teeth are like a squirrel's teeth. <laughs> Oh, I can be with that woman. It's her teeth are not that sharp. I can be with that. And a man is struggling with her stubbornness. But everybody, a woman also think, well, he has a serious drinking problem, or he's lazy, or he's not provider, or he's not protecting me, or he's not helping with the kids, or he's cheating, or he has a sex addiction, or other addiction. And she, every woman thinks, I deserve better. Isn't that true? Let's raise our hands. <laughs> Let's be honest. Everybody thinks, I deserve better, isn't it? <laughs> and that's where we struggle. Because God only gives us what we deserve. But the problem is, it's actually not the problem, it's a good thing. If you actually met a man, let's say, hypothetically, he's already worthy and wealthy and already is accomplished. By the way, this man, thousands of women are looking at him. But his pride is so high that if anything that you don't like about him, he will be very hard to influence. Because a woman is responsible for a man's character. And so when you meet a man and you know, yeah, maybe he has a little bit um, of drinking problem, or he's lazy, or a little bit else, once you marry it, you can influence your man to change. But then my question is, how do you, do you influence your man to change if you are married? Hmm? By serving? Yes, serving, but most importantly is by accepting him. For a man, the most difficult part is to accept a woman's character. Her teeth is her difficult character. But for a woman, it's hard to accept his negative quality. Again, maybe he's lazy, or maybe he's stubborn, or righteous, or whatever that is. And the only way she can influence him by accepting him. Once you accept, whether it's a woman, a wife, or a husband, a child, or a parent, what happens is person starts to connect to their consciousness. And once they connect to consciousness, guess what happens? They know what you want. And then they start having desire to change for you. Because acceptance is love. It's the highest form of love. And acceptance, we're going to talk about how to get to acceptance, is through askeza and mantra and prayer that I'm going to start showing you very soon. Because without it, you won't be able to accept the person. It's practically impossible. Because as a human beings, our heart wants just happiness. We want to be born and enjoy and be happy. And woman is born for happiness, by the way, and love. Men are born to have a conquer and victory over himself and his life. But woman is not born to conquer. For example, woman says, I want to lose weight. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to start eating 
sugar. Now all she thinks about is what? Sugar. sugar. She's thinking about chocolate and sweets and cookies, cake and sweets, and, and to her it's very hard. Because even that, askeza, to stop eating sugar is very hard for her. For a man to say, I'm gonna start going working out. And when he does it, he start overcoming himself and conquering life. But for a woman, it's very hard. That's why there's different askezas for men and women. So far, any questions? All right, so because you're yes, so... Yes, I'm sorry, to hear Yes, yes, yes. Um, I don't feel like anyone is monitoring the chat box. And uh -huh. the, at the Zoom, I've asked the question a couple of times. Can you repeat, please, the definition of askeza? I missed it earlier. I apologize Sure. Askeza, and Michael was not here either, which is perfect, and uh, Katya. So askeza is, let's say, for example, you are fasting. If you're fasting for yourself to lose weight, it's not askeza. But if you're fasting to connect to God, that's askeza. So this is something that we do in order to connect to God and that God wants from us. And I'm now going to be going over different askezas, so this is a really great question. There, for example, people who are hypothetically, but no, not, it's actually not hypothetically, people who are struggling financially is people who are very attached to money. So for example, if you see a person uh, who is sitting next to the church and asking for money or next to temple or synagogue and you give only one dollar but your heart wants to give five but you give only one dollar you will never flourish financially you will never flourish financially because when we give money we receive money but we have to be also responsible to how we give money because if you give to a homeless person five dollars and he buys beer this is bad karma also for you because he drank and now you're not going to get the blessing from god you gave him money to buy beer so that's why you always want to give money only for example food for life they're using this money to feed people they're not just praying they're feeding people. You can never go wrong if a person is feeding, especially uh, people who are praying, Vedas or priests or people around church. But the best way how we can grow financially is God is not even looking for us to give money most of the time, but give our service. But give our service not for money. You volunteer today. That's askeza. You do askeza, let's say, going to uh, feed homeless people under the bridge, giving them hamburgers and bottles of water. Because homeless person, 85% of the time, what do you think they need? Food and what else? Water. Water is part of food and what else? Shelter. Clothes. To them, shelter is a luxury. They need clothes and food. And if they're drinking, and if you're giving the money, again, this is bad karma to you, and we have to be responsible. So great question, Maya. So now, uh, uh, Eileen, if you can help me to break people into groups so you can connect better. What I would like for you to share is to get present. What are you dealing with in life that you want to overcome out of this lecture and practicing when you live today. So I would like for you to share, I'll give two minutes each. And here it's very important that you share authentically something that really inspires you. Not, for example, oh, I want to get a new job, but it doesn't expire you. But what something is at stake for you? What's at stake for me is you share, I want to get married. I want to find a good man. Or what I really want is to make my relationship work. Whatever that is really touching your heart. So, Eileen, please help me. Two minutes each, and Carolyn will switch us. <laughs> 